This may be stating the obvious, but we'll love horror here at Joe Blow Towers. What's your favourite scary movie? And it's great to see that the genre is currently thriving. With not just the obligatory franchise stalwarts that rely upon jump scares doing well. Hello. But also new and original movies such as Talk To Me and Ty West X follower Pearl. However, there's also a trend that won't go away and will never go away, of course, for better or worse. Yeah, you know what we're talking about, gore hounds. The remake. At the time of writing this particular episode, the world is just about to bear witness to the return of a supernatural phenomenon from the early 60s with Universal's The Exorcist Believer. But if reviews and a lack of pre release buzz is anything to go by, director David Gordon Green should perhaps step away from horror for a little while. However, what's intriguing is that despite the movie's apparent flaws, Hollywood is still looking back on existing IPs to make a book or two. Even if that means resurrecting the pea soup flying antics of William Friedkin's 1973 classic. Back in 2005, almost 20 years ago, MGM brought back another classic tale of the supernatural with the Amateurville Horror. It was based upon the novel, also titled The Amateurville Horror, by Jay Anson which was also adapted into the 1979 movie, and it became the ninth movie in the lengthy Amateurville film series. If you haven't seen the original, nor the 2005 remake, it would be fair and accurate to assume that it focuses on a haunted house and a poor family who become terrorized by its history. Houses don't kill people. People kill people. Well, we're taking a cautionary dive into the supernatural in this episode of Revisited, so watch out for ghouls in the bathroom mirror as we find out what the fuck happened to the Amateurville horror. The original movie was released to a fairly mixed reception back in 1979, with the voices of dissension critical of the tired cliches in the film. While those who liked the movie praised the familiar location of the haunted house as being particularly effective. The plot of the movie follows a couple of loved up newlyweds. What do you think? I love it played by James Brolin and Margot Kidder, and their three children, who move into a house in which a grisly mass murder happened a year previously. Of course, things that can go bump in the night begin to freak the family out, as their dream house quickly becomes the stuff of nightmares. The movie was successful enough that a prequel, Amateurville 2 The Possession, was released in 1982, and a sequel, Amateurville 3D, swiftly followed in 1983. Dodgy 3D movies were all the rage back then, with the unintentionally hilarious Jaws 3 bursting out of cinema screens a month later. Such was the success of the grown Amateurville franchise at the time, that the grand total of 9 movies now exist, including the 2005 remake we're looking back on in this episode. The plot of the 2005 remake sticks pretty closely to the 1979 original, with the story focusing on the Lutz family after they've moved into a house at 112 Ocean Avenue. Back in 1974, real-life mass murderer Ronald DeFeo Jr. killed six of his family members in the house. After claiming that he heard voices coming from the house, persuading him to slaughter his family. This time, the couple are played by a pre-Deadpool Ryan Reynolds Boom. and Australian soap opera star Melissa George who also have three kids in tow, just like in the original. One thing that stands out in the remake though, is how much Reynolds and George toned down the overacting from the 1979 movie, with James Brolin guilty of some awesome histrionics when possessed in some key scenes from the first film. Oh mother of God, I'm coming apart! Oh mother of God! The original film is regarded as a horror classic, but while it does have a few decent scenes, it's in no way a masterpiece. The plot drags along at a snail's pace for much of the runtime, and the visual effects, even for the time of release, are laughably bad. However, because of the premise and the over-the-top acting, you can still see why the movie has a huge cult appeal, and also why it managed to launch such a long-lasting franchise. This was clearly in the minds of the production team behind the 2005 remake, because, as we all know, it's easier nowadays to rinse existing IPs dry 
rather than spending time coming up with new and original horror classics. Or are we being harsh on modern Hollywood? Let us know your opinion of horror originality or lack thereof in Tinseltown today. Alongside the considerable talents of Ryan Reynolds, who, lest we not forget, has come a long way in his career since, from Deadpool to Wrexham of all places, and Aussie Melissa George, of course, we also get a pretty decent cast to support them. The most prominent name is probably future hit girl herself, Chloe Grace Moretz, who makes her feature debut as the Lutz daughter at Chelsea. It's a nice introduction to the movie world for Moretz, and one memorable scene sees her character traverse the roof of their haunted house before throwing herself off it. We also get the great Philip Baker Hall as Father Calloway, who also attempts to chew the scenery like he's a man possessed, which is ironic given the nature of the scenes he's in. Jimmy Bennett and Jesse James play the Lutz sons, Michael and Billy, while Rachel Nichols plays the Lutz underdressed babysitter who, after telling the kids about the murders that happened in the house previously, Oh, you are way too young to hear this, so cover your ears. Gets spooked out by one of its ghostly inhabitants before being taken away in shock by the paramedics. As mentioned earlier, the movie's director Andrew Douglas was most well known for his work on various music videos and the Amateurville Horror was his first major film gig. He does a decent enough job but, like any remake where the studio is looking to cut costs as much as possible, his lack of experience on bigger budget movie shows. Douglas began his career in Anthony Armstrong Jones Snowden's studio, try seeing that for a few bevies before going to work as a photographer for Esquire and The Face. His music video work included directing promos for artists such as Paul Young and Alison Moyer, and he also went on to direct two episodes of The Excellent Mindhunter in 2017. He was therefore a solid, if uninspiring hire for the studio, and while the movie does look pretty good, you can't help but wonder what a horror director with more of an eye for the genre would have conjured up. You can argue that some films should never be remade. I'm looking at you, Wicker Man. Not the beast! Not the beast! Ah! I'm losing my eyes! And I swear, if Universal dare touch Back to the Future, I'll seriously lose me shit. Well, I'll probably just roll my eyes and go back to wondering if Disney will ever make a proper Star Wars movie anytime soon. Anyway, I digress. The point is that Amateurville Horror is one of those movies whose hardcore fans will probably argue that a remake was completely unnecessary. And largely, they'd be right. However, you could also point to films such as the Swedish classic Let the Right One In that didn't need an American remake, but we got one anyway. And it was pretty decent to be fair. It didn't bring anything new to the original story, however, so did 2005's The Amateurville Horror manage to give us something new and suitably disturbing? Well, if we're being brutally honest, no, not really. It takes a lot to scare this particular gorehound, and spooky shenanigans and jump scares in a haunted house aren't going to get me jumping behind the sofa. When will Hollywood realise that predictable shocks with loud noises are such a tired and boring trope of the genre? I know we're talking about a movie from almost 20 years ago here, but it's still an issue with the mainstream horror genre nowadays, albeit a lucrative one for the studio still. This however, is probably just an aspect of the haunted house trope in horror movies being limited in its effective shock value. Even more recent TV shows such as An American Horror Story struggle to keep the shocks coming, with seasons 1 narrative being set in a haunted house, delivering some decent chills early on but ultimately losing its grip on what makes the sub-genre scary. Amateurville 2005 suffers from a similar problem and its narrative just follows a tired, seen it all before story, where the haunted shenanigans slowly build up to a predictable mess in the third act. Despite a lack of true scares, we do at least get a decent turn from the main cast. Reynolds does his usual joker shtick at the beginning. Tell one of the kids. Hey. <laughs> a little one. Before the house starts to get a grip on him, and he descends into a sociopathic, paranoid monster. George. I got this under control. You don't have you under control. He even gets some rather fetching bloodshot contact lenses, just so the audience knows he's gone full psycho. Because, you know, we would never have guessed it from all the shouting and the axe wielding. Go! 
So, if you're the kind of horror fan who's easily scared by overly loud sound design and being told exactly when you should be terrified, then, yeah, 2005's Amityville Remake will be a fun time for you. However, if you're after cult appeal and a movie that makes the most of its shortcomings by at least being stupidly entertaining, you're probably better off sticking with the 1979 original. The Amityville Horror Remake opened on 3,323 screens in the US on April the 15th, 2005, topping the box office chart with a decent haul of $23.5 million over its opening weekend. It went on to earn a total gross of just over $65 million domestically and ultimately earned $108 million internationally. Not a bad return on its estimated budget of $19 million. Critically, the movie fared less than well and it currently holds a 24% score on Rotten Tomatoes from a total of 163 reviews, if that sort of info holds any relevance for you. Most reviewers at the time bemoaned the lack of scares in the production, with the New York Times saying that the movie was low-key creepy rather than outright scary. The new Amateurville marks a modest improvement over the original, partly because, from acting to bloody effects, it is better executed, and partly because the filmmakers have downgraded the role of the priest, played in all his vain popping glory by Ron Steiger in the first film, and by a considerably more subdued Philip Baker Hall here. Rolling Stone were also less than impressed by the film, saying that first-time director Andrew Douglas crams in every ghost cliché, from demonic faces to dripping blood. This house springs so many VX shocks, it plays like a theme park ride. Result, it's not scary, just busy. For the real thing, watch Psycho, The Shining, The Haunting, or The Innocents. What all those films have in common is precisely what the new Amityville horror lacks. They know it's what you don't see in a haunted house that fries your nerves to a frazzle. Sounds harsh, but they have a point. The Times, on the other hand, were more forgivable in their appraisal of the movie, as they stated that There's something pleasurably batty about the way the family blunders on. The chills are satisfyingly creepy, the gory special effects are lavish and effective, and the wooden house itself is a sinister architectural pleasure. It's a total nonsense, of course, but I left the lights on that night anyway. Ultimately then, 2005's Amityville Remake is a pointless and tame, if sometimes entertaining, horror remake. The cast do their best with the material they're given, and it is fun seeing future Deadpool Reynolds try his best to be scary, spooky red contact lenses and all. More importantly though, what's your take on the remake? Are we being too critical of the movie's flaws, or should people stick with a cult classic original from 1979? As usual, let us know in the comments and we'll see you wonderful gorehounds next time. Thanks for watching.